You're watching Word Alive Bible Study at Word Tabernacle Church. I need a word, life changing, life changing word. A place of relevant ministry where relationships are built, needs are met, purpose is fulfilled, and God is enjoyed. Join us now as we get stronger, grow deeper, and go higher. Stronger, deeper, and higher every day. Ephesians chapter 5, um, let's look at it real quick, verses 1 and 2. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And we find these words, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us, gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This, I mean, this is fundamentally the lowest common denominator of Christian living. You know, the church at Ephesus was in the midst of a culture war. It's funny how things don't change. They're in the midst of a culture war, and many people that had gotten saved came out of that culture, and they didn't really make a shift easily. They did all of the right churchy things, in this, this new startup church. But the one thing they just kept falling asleep at the wheel was not loving each other. And I think oftentimes we minimize the importance of loving each other. And today I want to teach on that love as Christian Living 101. It's easy to miss in the text, but this is trickier to interpret than we realize. And the reason is because Paul opens up in chapter 5 with therefore, meaning there's a reference back to what he's previously taught us in chapter 4. So in chapter 4, he's saying don't grieve the Holy Spirit and, and put away bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, everything we learned about. Be kind. And then he says, therefore, be imitators of God. Therefore, function like God. Now, let me tell you how this is difficult. And I don't want to get too technical from a, a doctrinal seminary perspective, but there are attributes of God that we cannot imitate. So this becomes tricky because he's saying be imitators of Christ, be imitators of God. But there are certain non-communicable attributes of God if we were to be technical. God's attributes are communicable, meaning we share them, and non-communicable, meaning we don't share them. And you think about when we talk about God, right? We talk about God in the sense of being self-existent as an example. If we were gonna, if we're gonna take this seriously and be imitators of God, I can't be self-existent. Like, that's not possible, right? None of us possibly can be self-existent. God is the only one who utterly sets himself apart from everyone and anything else, any organization, any individual, any living entity. None of us, none of us would make it without oxygen right now. And think about how awesome God is. And I'm going to tell you, if you don't have a relationship with him, you, get, you need to know him. God is so awesome that he's like, I'm self-existing, meaning everything I need to exist contains within me. Like, I don't need anyone for anything. And that's something that should really humble us as we really think about how awesome God is because I think sometimes we function like from this lens of God needs me. God does not. God is fully self-existent, right? When we think about God, we think about him being self-sufficient, right? The fact that he doesn't depend on anyone. You know, the, the fact that whether it's food, warmth, think about how needy we are. <laughs> We are so needy, like food, warmth, clothing, uh, friendships. I mean, we are just needy. God is not. God is self-sufficient. He's eternal. I could never be an imitator. You could never be an imitator of that attribute. He's eternal. God always existed. He's always going to exist. We are incapable. How many times do we hear reference to God being omnipotent, right, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, right, omnipresent, present everywhere. That's a wonderful word to just 
release yourself from the pressure of having to take on all of God's attributes. When he says, therefore, be imitators of God, he's not talking about the non-communicable attributes that we don't share with God. Now, this is tough now because if, he's, if I'm saved, he's my father. If you're saved, he's your father. But there are elements of my father that I can't be like, which means that there have to be other elements of my father that I have to be serious about being like. So he is a God of justice. So I could be an imitator of him in justice. He is a God of wisdom, a God of faithfulness, a God of compassion, a God of mercy. And where I want to focus heavily today is he's a God of love. And we can take on that communicable attribute as Paul writes about, and I can be an imitator of God. And this is what he says, be an imitator of God as beloved children. See, that's why I, you probably wonder why you go there with communicable and non-communicable attributes. The reason is because Paul does. He says, be an imitator as beloved children which means that what I'm going to take on like Christ is only what I can take on as his child. So that's tenderness and goodness. And so let me say a couple things to introduce this, and then I want to share three big concepts. The first thing I want to say to introduce this is it is very difficult to be what we have never seen. The, the blessing for us in this is that, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but the blessing is that God is saying, everything I'm asking you to take on, you see in me. I've shown it to you. He, he says, walk in love. Here it is, as Christ loved us, as Christ gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So he's saying, it, it's, you know, it, and I, I've shared this in the past, but... You know, one of my questions whenever, after couples, couples are about to get married and um, they go through, first it was the Brits, now it's the Purvises, they go through premarital counseling. And then, you know, a couple months before the wedding, I get a chance to meet with the couple and talk about their wedding, talk about how counseling went, all that kind of stuff, make preparations for them, making sure everything's going to go well. And one question I typically ask is, if you had a dictionary and, and it didn't have any defined words, just words, right? And the way those words were defined were with pictures. And you looked up the word marriage, and it was the ideal marriage. For you, who would, who would be in that dictionary with a picture of that ideal marriage? 90% of couples say, we don't know, which kind of makes it difficult. Young men that struggle is because we're asking them to be something they've never seen. When, when, when people get married and they have to take on, I mean, you think about how much stuff we learn just from what we've been exposed to in our homes, just what we've been exposed to in our churches, right? It is so much easier. I think there's a mentoring group that has, has a model, has something to do with, you know, being able to see it. So if I can see it, I can be it, right? This is the value, just, you know, not to get too heavily into this, but, you know, when all the studies, I, I, as you know, I sit on a couple task force for the governor. One of them is around um, diversity and equity uh, in public education. And as we were researching and they were bringing in PhDs and people much smarter than us to give us all the data and all the literature, we started looking at the high percentage of African-American males um, not graduating with high school diploma. And we started trying to just layer by layer peeling back the data. And you know, is it social economics? Is it because they have one parent in the home? Is it because they had a parent incarcerated? Is it because they had a parent that was on drugs? Is it because of some mental health problem? Is it because they didn't own the home they lived in? When you peel back all of the data, the number one reason that the percentage is so high for black males not graduating high school is because they've never seen a black male teacher. The number one reason. They never saw anybody that looked like them in school. It is the tremendous value of modeling, and we're going to talk about that in our group discussion, 
it's the tremendous value of modeling what we want to be. You know, I'm 21 years of pastoring, and I still have a whole lot of my fathers in the ministry's demeanors, perspectives, ways of viewing scripture, because we take on what we see. I read a study, and I've witnessed this for myself. Um, the percentage of boys growing up in a single mother's home with no father, how many of them at five, six, seven, eight years old urinate by sitting down? Because they've never been in the bathroom with a man that urinated standing up. We model what we see. And this begins to be the significance and the importance. So Paul is saying to us, don't dare act like you can't do this because you've seen it in God. You're, you're a byproduct of it. You're a recipient of it. Let me say a second thing to introduce this. The second thing to introduce this is the family of God is the idea of the family raised to the superlative. Master, that's a whole lot. What, what, what are you saying here? When he talks about what we ought be in the church, he says, I want you to understand that church is a family, but it's family to the highest degree. It is family to the highest standard. It's family to the highest quality. He says, God produces in us, because we are believers, a family that no, no institution apart from the church can create. They can create communities. They can create uh, linkages. They can create alliances. But in the church, we create family to a superlative. And he said, the way this family at a high degree, a high standard looks is the way they love each other. That's the standard, y'all. And so, and when he says, when he says be an imitator, he, he's talking about being, being a, um, a mimicker. He says, I want you to mimic him. And when he says mimic him, he means copy God. Copy God speech. Copy him in his attributes. Copy him in his behavior. Copy him in his actions. Duplicate, echo his speech. You know, one of the things I love to see, I can't wait till we're fully back in a few weeks in the sanctuary and we get to see families worshiping together. I love to see, you know, children that are 8, 10, 12, 15 years old that the first person they saw lifting their hands in worship was their mother or father. And, and they didn't fully get it, but they understood it was something I needed to do. They were like mimickers of them. This is what we need to be in God, to a higher degree than the world is. This is not something that can be accomplished in worldly institutions. The love we're talking about is not something, no diss on, on any organization that's civic or social. God places this standard on the church, that we will love each other to a high degree. Be Pastor, where is that? Where is that? It's a high degree because it's as Christ loved us. That's a whole nother level. That's a whole different standard of love. As he loved us, I'm supposed to love. Let me say another thing, because this as he loved us gives me another point of introduction, which is because it's as he loved us, we have an enabling life of God within us by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Because it's been done to me and been placed in me, I now have the enablement to do it because of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. So when, as believers, we can never say, I can't do that. If you are saved and you are a byproduct of a, a, a love for God, love from God that is unconditional, then that means it has been embedded in you, indwelt in us by the Holy Spirit so that I can then live it out in my life. Y'all, that's a blessing. That gives me, that, that, there's no excuse. I can love someone with all sacrifice. I can love someone and put myself last. I do have it in me. It may be an act of my will fighting it, but it is in me. Final statement about this, I'm going to give you three big points, and I'm not going to teach real long today. The last statement I want to make in this introduction, letter D, under Roman, Roman, Roman number one in the introduction, is we are the church of Christ, not the church of culture. 
This is not the kind of love you get in culture. Now, I want to say this. I'm not, I think in order to reach culture, you have to know culture. In order to reach culture, you have to be, um, I think, respectful of culture. I, mean, I need to be aware of it. I'm not talking about ignoring culture. I'm talking about we don't get to act like the world. I don't get to dismiss you because I didn't like what you did to me. I don't get to walk away because you hurt my feelings. I don't get to go somewhere else just because I'm going through my little issue. The world can do all that. We don't get to jump sides. We don't get to dismiss each other. And so Paul is saying to us, be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Three things about this love, and that, this Christ-like living 101, for me, is all about love. Like, I'm, I, I don't know that there's anything, matter of fact, I do know, there's nothing more important. The, the thing that separates Christianity from Islam or Buddhism or, or other faith systems, the thing that separates us is the love of Christ. So the thing that makes us different is we have the love of Christ. So when we don't operate from love, we literally then dismiss what really makes us different. So the first thing that Paul gives us is the precept of love, it is the teaching of love. He says, listen, Love the way Christ loved you. He says, that's how you need to love. Walk in love as Christ loved us. Because I am, and let me tell you why this is important. If I am imitating Christ, then that means every action and every behavior is initiated by Christ. If I'm, if I'm imitating him. And so anything that's worth doing is worth doing beginning with God. So as I take on the lens of my heavenly father in Christ, that imitation, then that imitation means God is now initiating everything I do. He's the initiator of my actions. He's the initiator of my behavior. You probably know this, but there are lots of new people that, that get saved every week in our ministry, and they're starting from day one with the, the scriptures. They, they don't know their way all around the Bible. Um, they don't know all the Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic words, and they may not fully understand the depth of this. I want to remind us, the love that Paul is talking about in Christ, because in the Greek, you always have these four words for love. He's not talking about eros, right? That, as a matter of fact, interestingly enough, the city of Ephesus was, was known for having the kind of idolatry that they equated worship to erotic activity and behavior. That they had temple, they had uh, uh, temple uh, prostitutes and they worshiped at um, the altar of Diana, um, who was a multi-breasted goddess. And they viewed their religion from the lens of erotic behavior. And I think we have to redefine terms when God tells us to love each other, he's not talking about lusting after each other. He's not talking about erotic, sensual behavior. So, so he's not talking about eros. It's, and let me tell you what I, why I'm, I'm stressing this. Because we have a tendency in our culture to just want to love the people who bring us pleasure. To just want to love the people who make us feel good, who, who, who we like. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about eros. He's not talking about storge, right? The, the family kind of love. Um, you know, even I'll say a pet kind of love, because you know, we have some main, major love for our pets. We have, we have a little dog, a little toy, toy poodle named Dragon, and he's like part of the family, right? I mean, people love their pets. He's not talking about that. He's not talking about filio. He's not talking about this brotherly kind of love. Um, he's specifically talking about 
a spiritual divine love that only comes from God. Let, let me tell you how you know you're operating like that. It's that, 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 that agape love is the power to respond to a need in someone who can do nothing in return for you, who can do nothing to pay you back, who can do no, who may not even say thank you, who may not even respond. Loving to that degree. And let me just say this parenthetically. Until you have done something awesome for somebody that can't do anything back for you, you are missing real love and service. The real issue of love and service is no expectation of reward, no expectation of acknowledgement. It is the precept of love. Now, let me say something about this precept of love. The first thing that I want to say about this precept of love is that this love is made complete by obedience. Um, in John 14, 15, Jesus tells us, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I think oftentimes we don't recognize that the love that God calls us to is a love that's going to require an act of my will. It's going to require me to be obedient in some things that I may not want to be obedient, some things I may not really like. And for people that are in serious relationships with people or who are married, you know that sometimes the evidence of your love is your obedience. God is like telling you to do something. You're like, I don't really want to do that, but God, I love you, so I'm going to do it. And it's really the evidence of my love for him. And if you've not gotten to that point where like, I'm like, God, I can't make this about me. It's got to be about what you're calling me to do. It's got to be about you. Until you operate with that kind of obedience, you've not learned how to love yet. This love is made complete by obedience. It's that yes in your will. It's that yes in your spirit. It's like, God, I'm doing this because I love you. I'm doing this because I'm, it's not even, just even, it was a time in my life where I would do what God wanted me to do because I was scared of the results if I didn't. And there are still some times that that's the case. But now more than anything, it's like, God, I'm just doing this because I love you. That's the reason I love you. I really do, and so I want to be obedient. So the first thing that Paul does is that Paul gives us the precept of love. When you and I want to think about Christ-like living, the foundation, the fundamental of it, the fundamentals of it, it starts with love. Now, it's not just the precept of love. Let me say something else about this precept of love. The other thing about this precept of love is that God never requires anything of us that he doesn't reproduce in us. And so, be, going back to the point in the introduction about the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that empowers us to be and, and to do what we need to do, God is saying, you can live like this because I have already put this in you. I have already reproduced this in you. And so, what we, what we don't want to be is hypocritical. Because let me remind us all, God's greatest act of love toward us came when we were at odds with him. His greatest act of love did not come when you started singing on the choir. His greatest act of love didn't come when you started, wind up, started on church staff. His greatest act of love came when we were his enemy. So the reason this is so powerful is because that's the kind of love that is in us. We are the byproduct of that kind of love, which means I should not be limiting my love to people that I'm at my best with and they're at their best with me. And so if I'm treating you awkwardly and disrespectfully and unlovingly just because you're not with me, that I'm missing the love that's been placed in me by reproduction. God's like, I loved you, man. Watch this. Even though he's sovereign and he knew whether or not we would be saved, we didn't know. God is like, I'm going to love you without any guarantees you'll ever love me back. I'm going to love you without any guarantees you'll ever serve me. I'm going to be faithful to you without any guarantee you're going to be faithful. I'm going to start off with you even if I don't have a guarantee you're going to want to finish with me. See, all of the standards that we put in place, God doesn't have any of them. We're the only ones with all of this standard about love. It's got to be this, 
And that way, and under these pretenses, and this condition, and this situation, and then. God's like, no, I don't operate like that. I, I, you know what? I, I know you're going to cheat on me. I'm going to still love you. I know you're going to steal from me. I'm going to still love you. So he says, understand what this precept of God's love looks like. This is a standard Christian living. Here's the second thing. Not just the pre precept of this love, but the second thing he says is, this love is in Christ. It's in the sacrificial love of Christ. So it is the pattern of love. He gives us the pattern of love. When Paul says to walk this way, he says, and walk in love as Christ. That's the pattern. Christ is the pattern. If you're jotting notes down, put that in your margin somewhere. Christ is the pattern. Christ is the pattern, he says. He says, walk like Christ. When he says walk, let me tell you what he's referencing. When Paul uses the word walk in the pastoral epistles, he's depicting our outward life. He's depicting our progress in the Christian life. Because I want you to understand this. The Christian life never stands still. The Christian life is a life of movement. So he's saying, listen, the way I want you to walk in this. I want you moving in this. I want you operating in this. I don't want you standing still, just kind of being off to the side. I want there to be an example of your outward life. And this is, this is, this is deep. Let me tell you why this is deep. Because over and over again, who God is so convicting. Over and over again, the litmus test, the proof of my love for God is my love for people. Over and over again, that's the litmus test. Don't, we can't dare act like we love God and we don't know how to sacrifice for people. We don't know how to be patient with people. We don't know how. That's the litmus test. And, and so, and so let, let me, let me, this is not in your notes, but let me say it like this. Love is what I call the life principle of God, right? It's not in your notes. So just find the margin, jot that down. And this is not going to be in your discussion questions, so I'm going to give you one to think about. If you and I were to finish this sentence, my aim in life is blank, right? What would be in your blank? Um, if you had to boil everything you do to one word, what would the one word be? Some people are like, my aim in life is success. Some people, it's to get wealthy. Some people, it's approval. Some people, it's fame. Some people, it's achievement or wealth. The life principle for God is my aim in life is to love. For God so loves us. Over and over again, we get example after example of scripture of God's evidence of love. Now, I want to say something about this. What does it look like from a functional day-by-day -day reality? I'm going I'm to give you three concepts that I'm weaving into these three major points. The, the first word I want you to write down is forgiving. When we look at this, how does God love us? The way he loves us is by forgiving us. Um, Y'all, I, I want you to... I got so convicted about this. I was, let, me, let me read a little bit of Romans 3 real fast. There's nobody righteous. I'm just paraphrasing real quick. Not nobody. This is what God says. Everybody's turned away. Everybody, this is us, y'all. Nobody good. That, that poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And the way of peace, they don't know. There's no fear before their eyes. Y'all, that's how before Christ we're seen. Now, I want you to get where I'm going. So if that's all I am, I'm all of that, and yet God forgives me because he loves me, then this was the convicting point. Nobody is capable 
of acting as bad toward you as you did to God. So see, whatever I'm holding on to, <laughs> I need to get a whole different attitude. No person, regardless of whatever they have ever done or will do to me, is capable of being as bad toward me as James Gillier was toward God. And God says, you know what? Even despite all of that, I love you so much, I forgave you. So the issue of this Christ-like behavior is li literally grounded. This love is grounded in forgiveness. We, we can't, as believers, hold on to a bunch of just past. I mean, when do we let go? When do we say, God, you know what? I, if I were to be honest about, see, the problem, I think, is we see ourselves the way we see ourselves and not the way God sees us. I see myself pretty good, you know, but God is like, well, you, you, you're all right now, but before me, bro, you don't realize you, you had some situations with you, and yet I reserved my greatest. Some of y'all, right, right? Jot down, go for homework, Romans 3. Verses 10 to 18. And, and, and just read that this week. Read all that we were through the eyes of God, rebellious against his love, against his moral standards, and yet finding ourselves forgiven on the basis of the death, the atoning death of Jesus Christ. So this love begins fundamentally with forgiveness. Um, wow. Let me say a second thing, or third thing, I'm sorry. The, 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 it, it's not just the precept and the pattern of this love, but the last thing I want to leave us with is the price of this love. Um, as Christ loved us, and watch the price, and gave himself. If you underline gave himself, jot down gave himself. Let, let, let me give you some examples in scripture. First John chapter four, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love towards us while we were still sinners. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. Y'all, Philippians 2.5 starts talking about how God doesn't merely give up things to save us. He gives himself up, makes himself as no reputation. Let me tell you why this matters. It's because I think too often times, so I told you I'm going to weave in three words real quick. The first word I want, you to, I want to weave in is forgiving, right? Now watch this. The second way we live this out is not just forgiving, but the second word is giving. And y'all, this, this is... Man, so convicting for me, because when we start studying God's love for us, it always, here's the, the, the point A to this, anything truly important is costly. And, and I think, y'all, that we have forgotten the significance of sacrifice as believers, and sometimes in order to do what God is calling me to do and love you the way I need to love you, it's going to cost me. It's going to cost me my reputation sometime. I mean, how, you think about it. You know, uh, there's been infidelity in a marriage, and, and, but the, 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 the spouse that was, that was uh, 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 cheated on was like, but I love my husband, I love my wife. Now watch this, watch what it costs you. It costs you your reputation where people are like, I can't believe she stuck, it with that, stuck out with that man that, that did her like that. And, and, and watch this, some of the very people that say that are Christians, right? So it can cost us our reputation, it can cost us um, family, friends. It, it can cost us so much, but God is like, I love you so much that I give, that I'm willing to give my son up for you. And y'all, we have to learn to love with that level of sacrifice. Sometimes it's going to cost me my time. Sometimes it's going to be a sacrifice of my money. Sometimes it's going to be a sacrifice of my priorities. Can y'all handle, hope y'all can handle it like James Gilliard's real honest, this is just me talking to God let me let y'all in on conversation I have with God all the time. And I say all the time, I mean all the time. P 
people assume, particularly now, this massive building infrastructure and all this, and people like have a tendency to kind of look at you kind of like, wow, man, I'm so, I wish I was you, man. You, man, you get to do all this. You get to experience all this. Let me tell you what folk don't realize. This is not my dream, it's God's. It's not my vision, it's God's. The conversation I have with God is do you think you'll let me go when I have enough health <laughs> and enough strength that I can do some stuff I wanna do? See, the assumption is that nobody is, nobody is, is comes around like, I just, this is what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to work every weekend. I'm going to give up my family. I'm going to give up this. That's what I'm going to do. No. When you love, it costs you. So in love of God, and I told you, when you love, it manifests in obedience. But the assumption, I think, is that we see people in the space they're walking in, and we assume that what they're doing is what they want to do and not understanding it's what God is calling them to do, and it may be what the cost they had to pay. Let me give you this last point, and then we'll go through questions and we'll be done. This is so convicting for me. The reality is, letter B, it's the last blank on the handout. The reality of I can give and not love, but I can't love and not give. Woo. How convicting is that? I, so lots of folk can give. That doesn't mean they love you. But if I love you, I have to give. I, my time, my priorities. I mean, how many of us sacrifice? I don't know how many parents listen to me teach. But when you're a parent and you love your child, you give up your life for them. You, you're not vacationing. You're not doing what you want to do. You're not going where you want to go. You're not, sometimes you're the only one in the house that didn't get new sneaks. Because when I love you, I give. That's just what we do as believers. God is the evidence of that. I love you, so I give you my son. I would dare not ever expect that I would love you and then nobody gives. No, if we love God, we should be giving. If we love each other, we should be giving. That, that manifests itself in our gifts, our time, our money, our stewardship, our attitudes. If we love, we give. Y'all, that's the premise of our basic Christian living, according to Paul here in Ephesians chapter 5, in the midst of a culture where it was always about me, me, me. And now here comes this body of believers in the midst of the temple of Diana, in the midst of temple prostitutes, in the midst of erotic behavior where it was always about themselves. And Paul is like, nah, nah, no, we are, we are a church, we are a family at a higher level. And this family at a higher level, we're going to love each other sacrificially. We're going to love the way Christ loved us, the way he gave himself up for us. I want to ask you a question. I want to encourage you to do something. Would you pray about being the person that someone else benefits because you gave up your priorities for. You gave up your preferences for. You gave yourself up for them. And so this week, so here's the last word. I promise you three words. So, and what I'm going to do in these three words is summarily give you the teaching in these three words. So, Pastor, what does this Christ-like behavior look like? What does this Christ-like one-on-one look like? This love, what does it look like? Number one, it's forgiving. We got that, right? Number two, it's giving. And number three, it's living. So this Christ-like behavior manifests in forgiving, giving, and living. Can we live in such a way to sacrifice some of our desires, some of the things that matter to us for the benefit of other people. And so as we process this this week in our small groups, um, here's some questions I want us to think about. Number one, whom did you try to imitate when you were young and why? Um, that can be very convicting. <laughs> And sometimes I've seen it over and over again, man. I, 
Do you know how many young people are the byproducts of their exposures? And, and so have a conversation about the people you tried to imitate, the people that were role models for you and why. The second thing I want us to think about in our small groups this week is in what ways am I setting an example for others to imitate? Um, you know, one of the things I love about the Apostle Paul, he says to several, and several times to the early churches, he was like, all right, listen, until you get to know God for yourself, until you get to live out all of this stuff that you're, before you get to learn the scriptures, this is what Paul says, just do like I do. Until you, and that, that's like mind boggling, right? We don't think of it from that lens. How quick are we to say sometimes the only Bible people will ever read is your life, but yet we don't live like that? And so how am I setting myself up as an example for other people to imitate, for other people to follow? Um, Y'all, and I'm going to say this to parents, you know, your children are watching. Not just our children, even children around us are watching. And so we have to ask ourselves, how am I, how am I setting myself up as an example to imitate? Um, you know, this may sound very superficial, but, you know, generally speaking, you know, I stand in front of you, you know, with a suit on, generally with a tie on. And some of that's because I just want to represent Christ at the highest level I can on this personal level. But some of it is I just want, I want, some, I want our kids to be around black men that wear a suit and tie, that, that just have a different level of exposure. And so in, in every regard, I'm talking about in our dress, in our language, in our behaviors, by what we listen to, by where we go, by who we hang out with, by what we say about other people, how are we being an example? And then the last thing to process this week in small groups is what price or what prices have I paid to love in my home, in my church, and in my community? I, um, I feel the Lord giving me this word of encouragement for somebody. And here's the word of encouragement. Don't dare hang your head in shame or feel bad about yourself because you are sacrificing at home to show your love for somebody. Don't you dare feel like you're less than because you are able to love in a way that requires sacrifice. So we need to pay a price. What price do we all pay? You know, there's a price that I pay to be your pastor. There's a price my family pays for me to be your pastor. There's a price some of you pay to be on staff or to be active in the ministry. There's a price you probably have to pay at home, right, to be able to love people. Let's talk about that this week. And let's make sure that we are all doing our sacrificial part to love each other the way Christ loved us. Say amen if you can. Thanks for listening to Orthos. Hope you enjoyed today's Bible study. If you've got questions or comments or feedback, I'd love for you to share it with me. You can email me at james at jamesgalliard.com. I would also encourage you to follow me on one of my social media outlets. Go ahead and subscribe either at Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Instagram. Again, thanks for listening. See you next week.